the 7th of July 2017, 122 countries voted in favour of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Countries that don't have nuclear weapons, but live under their threat, voted for a ban. Without the knowledge of most of their citizens, the governments of the world's nuclear powers didn't vote. And yet the ban went ahead. Something new is happening. So the humanitarian initiative was really a way to challenge the mainstream security discourse that treat these as tools of international security, um, the language of deterrence, uh, treating these weapons as something that prevents conflict, instead of actually examining them for what they are. So the focus changed from tools of security and stability to human beings are destroyed. Nuclear weapons are catastrophic to humanity and catastrophic to life on this planet. After all, it's the people who suffer, and this has been forgotten in that debate. Now, we today have a massive body of evidence that a nuclear war would simp simply not only not be winnable, it would likely destroy life on Earth as we know it today. I mean, basically, I think we face an incredibly dangerous situation. I think if we don't get rid of these weapons, they are going to get rid of us. And everything that we cherish, and it doesn't have to be. It's not a practical weapon. It's basically a, just a big symbol. And I think that's why the treaty is so effective, because you fight symbols with other symbols. The international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons was launched by people who consider that nuclear weapons produce unspeakable suffering in human beings and create an unacceptable humanitarian catastrophe. So we established this campaign around 2006 and we felt that the specific objective needed to be a treaty that outlawed nuclear weapons completely. Uh, so we're about 11 years old now um, and was very much inspired by the campaign to ban landmines and the Cluster Munitions Coalition. The process at the United Nations is ongoing and 50 countries need to ratify the treaty for it to enter into force. That is not to say that nuclear weapons will disappear the next day, but it is the beginning of the end. We Hibatsha had been waiting for the ban for 72 years. Let this be the beginning of the end of nuclear weapons. The history of nuclear weapons is short. At the time of the Second World War, several scientists revealed that it would be possible to make an enormously powerful bomb using atomic fission. German armed forces could have succeeded in their research and come up with the ultimate weapon. At the moment of surrender, Hitler had in the blueprint stage transoceanic rockets, which could have destroyed our city. <laughs> The US government regarded this as a matter of survival and allocated huge resources to the construction of the atomic bomb. But by the time the first test took place in the New Mexico desert, when a miniature sun announced the beginning of the nuclear age, the German army had already surrendered. The decision to use the bomb on Japanese cities was taken in a new situation marked by the approaching end of the war and the partitioning of the world among the victorious powers. In the Second World War, armies massacred civilian populations by ruthlessly raising entire cities to the ground. These bombings anticipated the nuclear horror to come. On August 6, 1945, a uranium bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. At that moment, I saw in the window uh, the tremendous flush. And I couldn't comprehend 
But before you had a chance to comprehend what was happening, I knew my body was flying up in the air. After that, I lost consciousness. Now, when I regained the consciousness in the total darkness and uh, silence, I knew, finally, Americans got us. I couldn't move my body, so I knew I faced death. But I wasn't panic-stricken at all. Then, all of a sudden, strong hand touched me from behind. Don't give up, don't give up. Keep moving, I'm trying to free you. You see the light coming from that opening and move toward it as quickly as possible. Now, I'm trying to free you. Come on, keep pushing, keep kicking. Finally, he was able to free me. Also, it happened at 8.15 in the morning. It was dark, dark like twilight. And then I began to see in the dark some moving objects. But they were so silent. They didn't look like human beings. The hair was standing up and all curled up and skin and flesh were just falling out. Some were carrying the eyeballs in their hands. The skin and the flesh hung. <laughs> the majority of my schoolmates were working in the center part of the city. They are the first one who simply vaporized, melted. From my school, over 300 students were there. I'm alive because I wasn't there. I was somewhere else, far, you know, one mile away. I was inside a building. I was buried by the collapsed building. I must have been protected. But those people had no protection directly under. The explosion caused untold suffering and no one could assist the wounded. Three days later, a plutonium bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. In addition to the people who died immediately, victims would continue to die from radiation sickness for a long time to come. So you can imagine the situation when the ICRC, so we, we were, our doctors uh, and delegates, happened upon the scene in Hiroshima. Out of 300 doctors present in Hiroshima, 270 had died. Out of 1,700 nurses, 1,600 had been killed. And out of some 140 pharmacists, 120 had been killed. So the original number of fatalities in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of 1945 was 140,000 in Hiroshima and 70,000 in, in Nagasaki. Those figures uh, increased two, between two and threefold in the next five years due to radiation sickness from radiation exposure. In the first second, the white light is blinding, the heat immense. In the first day, fires consume the city and there's no way to fight them. Your skin is badly charred. In the first week, those hospitals that are still functioning are overwhelmed and can't treat the injured. Others who seem fine suddenly fall ill and die from radiation sickness. In the first year, radiation has seeped into the water and the soil. Crops and animals are contaminated. The humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons are horrific and span generations. It's time to ban them now. A corto plazo vamos a tener efectos por, por básicamente cuatro cosas. Eh, la onda expansiva te va a hacer unos vientos huracanados que destruyen todo a su paso y que eh, convierten eh, a todo, incluso los mismos cuerpos humanos, en proyectiles. Luego eh, se produce una onda de calor en el orden de los eh, millones de grados centígrados que eh, lo que esté más cerca o dentro de, de, de las partes eh, más calientes de esa onda se evaporan, se vaporizan. Pues el efecto que depende de la dosis de la radiación y el que depende solamente de la exposición a la radiación gamma. 
Eh, ante una exposición bastante grande, los efectos pueden durar horas o incluso días. Hay una destrucción masiva de los órganos internos. A, a, a las dosis medianas pueden durar meses o años recuperándose de lesiones si es que se recuperan. Y si se logran recuperar, entonces hablamos de los efectos crónicos, que sería una incidencia mucho más alta de varios tipos de cáncer, especialmente la leucemia, el cáncer de tiroides, cáncer de mama. For example, my uncle and aunt, when we heard they survived, we rejoiced. But a week later, they started feeling so sick. They started vomiting on, and they started having purple spots all over the body. And that was a sure sign they are going to die. La, la bomba nuclear produce una onda electromagnética que este, interrumpiría la comunicación electrónica, afectaría muchísimos aparatos eh, de los cuales depende, eh, dependemos ahora actualmente, especialmente en los hospitales. And a lot of people suffered with a scar, a very bad scar. They, look, they didn't look nice. So some thoughtless people started calling them all oh, their ghosts and so on. Social alienation, yeah, and discrimination was real. So those girls with that kind of, you no, know, they lost the opportunity for equal treatment for anything, employment, marriage, housing, and whatnot. So it was not just the physical damage, but the social, psychological, in every way, the city just dis disappeared. The use of the bomb was justified as a necessary evil to quickly bring the war to an end. But this is now questioned by historians. Recent research shows that uh, it's highly unlikely that the Japanese surrendered because of nuclear weapons. They surrendered because the Soviets came into the war the night before we bombed Nagasaki, the Soviet Union declares war. It significantly changes our view of nuclear weapons writ large because Hiroshima was the first impression. It was the, the notion that set up all the subsequent thinking. And if we change how we think about, about Hiroshima, it changes everything. From that point on, any power that did not have nuclear weapons would feel vulnerable. In subsequent years, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France and China developed their own atomic bombs in a context of confrontation between Western and Eastern blocs during a period known as the Cold War. This is also the time when the United Nations was founded in an attempt to create a forum for mediation in order to prevent conflicts from escalating into armed confrontation. Member states also signed the Charter of Human Rights, universal rights above national interests and power. However, these aspirations gave way to a harsh reality in which two superpowers dominated the planet by force and endangered it with an irresponsible arms race. Uh, the United Nations had been working to address the threat of nuclear weapons since its foundation. Um, the very first resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly was for the total elimination of all weapons adaptable to mass destruction. And yet it took all that time to finally put in place a, a total ban on the weapons. Up to 2,000 nuclear weapon tests were carried out with increasingly powerful bombs. It has been estimated that the radiation from these tests has affected millions of people. And in order to test nuclear weapons, primarily they've been tested on the lands of indigenous people. They've been tested on the lands of those without power. And that's, that's deliberate. So in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, nuclear weapons were tested in Australia by the British government with the full support of the Australian government. Uh, and this has had a profound impact, particularly on the indigenous communities that live nearby. And even though the tests stopped decades ago, the consequences are still being felt today. In Japan, the US military photographed and measured everything, 
including the consequences of radiation on bodies and human health. But all this was unknown to ordinary people. All information was censored for a long time, including survivors' testimonies. Well, later on, the United States established something called ABCC, Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So people were so happy, finally we were going to get some medical attention, medical supply. But no, the sole purpose of those was to study the effect of radiation on human body, but not to give supply or help, medical help. When people found that out, you can imagine, they felt, oh, they are simply using us as guinea pig. And then there was quite a bit of uh, oppression, so people were not that free. Even the press were not free to write about. And not only that, they started confiscating personal things among the survivors. Some people kept the diaries, or the pictures, photographs, slides, all kinds. Of, but those things were too dangerous. They were all confiscated, 32,000 items and all, and they were shipped back to Washington. Nor was it known to Americans until a few brave journalists dodged the censorship so that people could learn of the nuclear horror. Nuclear weapons were justified as defensive weapons. It is the doctrine of deterrence. A nuclear bomb is supposed to deter the enemy from attacking. In the case of the two Cold War blocs, mutually assured destruction was said to be the guarantor of world peace and security. Since World War II, however, there have been several occasions when confrontation has been on the verge of ending in nuclear war. The best known is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Open warfare loomed and several advisers to President Kennedy advised him to invade the island and even use nuclear weapons. Finally, a step backwards was taken at the last moment and this close shave created the conditions for the first agreements to limit nuclear testing. So deterrence, uh, the notion that nuclear weapons have kept us safe during crises is uh, simply historically inaccurate. The, uh, nuclear believers often say deterrence has been perfect because there's been no nuclear war. It's a ludicrous argument on the face of it. Uh, in 1948, uh, the Soviets uh, blockaded Berlin, and it's a situation which could easily have led to nuclear war. The United States had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, but the Soviets weren't deterred. In 1950, the Chinese uh, joined the Korean War despite the US moving nuclear weapons to Guam, and so on. You say deterrence has never failed, clearly it has. If human beings are fallible, and if human beings are involved in nuclear deterrence, then nuclear deterrence, by definition, is inherently flawed. It will fail. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. The danger of intentional use is compounded by the risk of accident. There are currently 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert that can be launched within minutes. In 1983, the Soviet radar system misinterpreted a cloud formation as a missile attack. So many stories of near misses and this Colonel Petrov from Russia who was such a hero. He was in the missile silo and he saw something that indicated that they were being attacked by us and he was supposed to unleash all his bombs against New York and Boston. Why? and he waited and it was a computer glitch. And he even got reprimanded for not following orders. This, it's like uh, we're just lucky. We're living in a fantasy. We you know of at least six occasions when the world has come within minutes of nuclear war because deterrence failed, because one or the other nuclear weapon state, usually the United States or Russia, believed it was under attack and actually began the process of launching its own nuclear weapons, only to stop at the very last minute when the mistake was discovered six times that we know about that this has happened. 
This is an insanely dangerous situation. Todas aquellas herramientas, en este caso armas, que inventamos, se acaban usando. Cuando hay una probabilidad de uno por mil, tú dejas pasar suficiente tiempo y se produce el hecho del uno por mil, ¿no? In 1968, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed by the vast majority of sovereign states. It sought to restrict possession of nuclear weapons and stop their proliferation, but it did not outlaw possession by the five states that had already conducted tests at that time. And five countries, the US, Russia, China, England and France, promised to give up their nuclear weapons if all the rest of the world wouldn't get them. And everybody signed this treaty except India, Pakistan and Israel, and they went and got their own bombs. For about 70 years, uh, we had sort of an in international legal system that accepted that five countries have it. It didn't reject nuclear weapons. It did say that we should work towards disarmament, but it also kind of acknowledged that, well, these countries have them so far and they are kind of important for security for them. And that's just not, um, it's just not good enough for, the, in, for law. Uh, you can't have a, an apartheid law that treats people differently or countries differently. You have to have the same rules for everyone, otherwise it's inconsistent and it's not going to work. Nuclear proliferation and technological progress are creating new dangers. There is a possibility that a small group could make a bomb. There is also the danger that a country with nuclear weapons could suffer internal ruptures or social unrest and weapons would no longer be under safe control. Computer systems can also be hacked Finally, any kind of explosion at a nuclear power plant would create massive, uncontrollable contamination. Millions of people would be exposed to lethal doses of radiation, and tens of millions of people would be exposed to doses of radiation that would put them at increased risk for cancer should they survive the immediate post-war period. So this is, this is an enormous problem, and um, one which is, is generally ignored completely. Even a conflict confined to a small area would have global consequences for billions of people. The global consequences come from climate disruption. A hundred Hiroshima-sized bombs going off over a hundred cities cause a hundred firestorms. And they loft about five and a half million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere, which blocks out the sun, cools the planet, dries the planet, and as a result of this disruption of food production, this limited war would, we believe, trigger a worldwide famine that would put up to two billion people at risk of starvation. In the 1980s, the arms race was reaching its peak. Thousands of nuclear warheads were produced each year, reaching a total of 70,000, enough to destroy the planet several times over. Since the beginning of the nuclear age, warnings and protests from the scientific community followed one after the other and were quickly taken to the streets. In November 1961, Women for Peace were pioneers when they went on strike and publicly demonstrated and marched against nuclear weapons in 60 cities across the United States. So women have always been at the forefront of anti-war activism. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom was actually founded in 1915 during a war, uh, during World War I. And it was founded by women from all over the world. Women were instrumental in the 1960s campaigning for a nuclear weapon test ban treaty, um, collecting baby teeth to show the effects that atmospheric nuclear testing was having on the environment and on children um, and on citizens throughout the world. In Europe, pacifists organized marches and protests against nuclear weapon bases in several countries. Some of the biggest took place in the United Kingdom, where the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament organized protest marches from 1959 and created the symbol that has remained associated with peace. In 1982, a million people gathered against nuclear weapons in New York. A year later, in Europe, there were massive protests in several cities, bringing some three million people onto the streets. 
The 1980s saw the possibility of a limited nuclear war in Europe, where both sides had enormous supplies of short-range nuclear weapons. Military exercises created a pre-war environment, tension was at its height, and the social climate occasionally turned apocalyptic. They had a march in Kazakhstan that was led by this so, uh, Kazakh poet, Olza Suleimanov, because the people in the Soviet Union were so upset in Kazakhstan. They had so much cancer and birth defects and waste in their community. And they marched and stopped nuclear testing. Gorbachev said, OK, we're not going to do this anymore. En Zaragoza teníamos una base norteamericana y por tanto éramos objetivo nuclear evidente. Promovimos lo que fue el primer, la primera movilización pacifista poderosa en España a la base norteamericana, que fueron 30 kilómetros de cadena humana, más de 30.000 personas. A movement in Europe, in the Soviet Union, here in North America, stopped that march to war. We reversed the Cold War arms race, and I believe that we saved the world. But the turmoil caused by these alarms and social protests created the conditions for a succession of treaties and effective reductions in nuclear arsenals. The turning point came when Reagan and Gorbachev met twice in the mid-1980s. Despite the difficulties, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was signed in 1987, putting an end to the Euro missile crisis. This trend towards disarmament was followed by long-range missile reduction treaties in the early 1990s. The pacifist movement started to fade away as international tensions relaxed, although in reality, the nuclear danger remains over our heads. In the meantime, vast areas of the planet declared themselves nuclear weapon-free zones. In 1991, South Africa joined the Non-Proliferation Treaty and began dismantling its six bombs. Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan turned over to the Russian Federation the nuclear weapons they had inherited from the Soviet Union. The Warsaw Pact was dissolved and the Cold War ended in the early 1990s. A détente had been achieved. But a few years later, things started to get complicated again. Despite the disappearance of its original enemy, NATO continued to exist and expand. Reagan said to Gorbachev, uh, don't worry, let East Germany be united, West Germany enter into NATO, and we promise you we will not expand NATO one inch to the east. The justification for military spending turned towards the alleged danger from so-called rogue states. Wars and occupations took place that did nothing to create the right conditions in which disarmament treaties could advance. In 1995, as the disarmament envisioned in 1968 had not been accomplished, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference decided to extend the treaty indefinitely in exchange for the creation of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East, something that has yet to be accomplished. In this context, attempts to create international networks of anti-nuclear organisations began with the appearance of Abolition 2000. Then we got together and drafted our own statement. We asked for a treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons by the year 2000. We acknowledged the inextricable link between nuclear weapons and nuclear power and asked for the uh, phasing out of nuclear power and the establishment of an international renewable energy agency. Five decades since coming into force, the MPT has not fulfilled its promise to achieve disarmament. The NPT uh, commits states in Article 6 to nuclear disarmament, to effective measures towards nuclear disarmament. Well, it's, there's a loophole because it doesn't promise like the chemical and biological weapons say they're prohibited, they're illegal, they're unlawful. The NPT just said we five countries make good faith, will make good faith efforts, that's the language, to eliminate, you know, for nuclear disarmament. Although the number of nuclear warheads is not increasing, investment in arsenal modernization has continued. Se están invirtiendo miles de millones de dólares al año. 
Actualmente 120 mil millones de dólares al año. Estamos usando muchísima plata, la plata con la que podríamos estar eh, eh, librando al mundo enteramente de la hambruna, dándole educación primaria para absolutamente todo el mundo. Climate change, poverty, inequality. We can't be wasting billions of dollars on nuclear weapons. Currently, the nine nuclear weapon states have almost 15,000 bombs between them, and all of them are more powerful than the one dropped on Hiroshima. The vast majority of nuclear weapons are in the hands of the United States and the Russian Federation. Five countries host US bombs on their territories, and 28 others are involved in nuclear alliances. But most countries do not have nuclear weapons, nor do they belong to any military alliance. But they do share the risk of confrontation, even if it occurs far from their territory. This is what re-energized so many governments, particularly in the Global South, to take this issue up again. Um, the idea that nuclear weapons uh, do not respect borders, that even a single detonation would affect uh, everyone everywhere, was something that was very significant to these countries that uh, have security interests when it comes to nuclear weapons. Furthermore, within the UN, several countries have joined forces and managed to push through bans on different types of weapons, such as anti-personnel mines and cluster bombs. These bans achieve success. They stop these weapons from being manufactured and used, even without support for their ban from the military powers. Yeah, but no one's saying that chemical or biological weapons are okay for certain countries but not others and, and no one's saying that uh, it's okay to be sheltering under a chemical weapon umbrella or a biological weapon umbrella. In 1980, the association International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War was created on the basis of ethical considerations shared by physicians from both blocs. It is this association that 26 years later would launch the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Basically, I think what drove all of us was this idea that nuclear weapons pose the greatest threat to public health in, in the history of the world, and that as physicians, we have a responsibility to address that problem because all the things that we do for our patients in the course of our daily practice are going to be for naught if the world blows up in a nuclear war. The campaign called for the negotiation of a comprehensive, irreversible, binding and verifiable treaty which could be agreed by a majority of countries. From 2010 onwards, the campaign turned the focus towards the humanitarian catastrophe caused by nuclear weapons and away from national security considerations, which had been the dominant narrative until then. All of the states party to the non-proliferation treaty agreed by consensus that any use of nuclear weapons would have catastrophic humanitarian consequences and nuclear weapons must be considered through the lens of international humanitarian law. That really opened up space for an examination of the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons once again. And at the same time there was also this started these joint statements at the UN, you know, 16 governments got together to acknowledge the catastrophic humanitarian concern, uh, consequences. Um, saying that any use of nuclear weapons would have this and under no circumstances should nuclear weapons be used. And this was quite, you know, like a radical, but, you know, a sort of slowly, quite uh, silently changing the narrative. This new approach opened up participation to non-nuclear weapon states, academia and civil society. In 2013 in Oslo, diplomats from 128 states met to study the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and they continued in Mexico the following year, challenging the boycott of the five nuclear-armed permanent members of the UN Security Council. The rules of the game were starting to change. It was the first time that you'd even organised something that the P5 didn't support. But we had the Civil Society Forum, the ICANN Civil Society Forum on the eve of this big conference. And we had the then State Secretary of Norway, Gilly Larsson. And she talked about, uh, in front of 600 ICANN people in the audience, talked about the, the boycott. Uh, well, they've been very angry, the P5. They came and they demarched us and said, you know, this is a distraction. And she just sort of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, 
you know, their arguments weren't very convincing. And the whole audience laughed, and it was the first time we laughed at the P5. And, you know, I just, it, right there, it just clicked like, oh my God, this is all about changing power dynamics, and this is all about controlling the narrative, and we're doing something, and they're on the outside. A lot of new evidence was, uh, was uh, unveiled, and, and we heard very uh, poignantly and, and prominently from the survivors, the Hibakusha, and also the nuclear test uh, survivors. Looking at um, the effects of an explosion, what this does to human bodies, what this does to cities, um, but also what it does to our economies and our way of life looking at the connections between the impacts and also the risks that we currently face, um, both in terms of intentional use of nuclear weapons, but also the risks from failures in command and control structures uh, or accidental use of nuclear weapons. Well, in Oslo, we presented evidence about our uh, inability to provide an adequate humanitarian response in case of use of nuclear weapons. No equipment exists to protect them from some of the radiation seeping through. Can you justify putting even more people at risk? Even if you get in, the number of victims is beyond anything you've ever seen. I was in Nayarit, Mexico at the second conference on, that led to the treaty and there was a moment in the afternoon on the last day that was amazing. Seventy years the nuclear armed states have told everyone else, we'll manage this, you stay home, don't worry about this, we've got it. And I think it was at that moment that the rest of the world woke up and said, this will affect us. We have a right, we have an obligation to have our voices heard on this. In 2014, with the third conference in Austria, a critical mass of countries supported the so-called humanitarian pledge, committing themselves to undertake efforts to stigmatize, ban, and eliminate nuclear weapons. The conclusion was that there was a legal gap. There was no prohibition in place on nuclear weapons and that was a problem and Austria committed their pledged to work to fill the legal gap. The road for advancing under the non-proliferation treaty seemed to be coming to an end while the path towards a complete ban on nuclear weapons was opening up. In 2016 an open-ended working group was set up at the United Nations which recommended negotiating a ban. It's a very complicated way to say we'll have a bunch of meetings <laughs> where we're going to talk about what we can do to get rid of nuclear weapons. We had pushed and we'd done all the work and we had been reaching out to governments and we had held regional meetings, we've been talking to parliamentarians and we've been nagging, nagging, nagging for like three years. And at the Open and the Working Group it's almost like you pulled out a plug and the support just came out from everyone. And so by the end of this meeting in 2016 um, we had uh, well over a hundred countries going on the record saying that they wanted the General Assembly to negotiate a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. That's the government side of what happened. But behind the scenes and in the streets and through creative actions, people have been pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure this happened. This wasn't just a couple of people in suits saying, oh, let's have some meetings. By 2017, the treaty had gained a lot of support. Negotiations were conducted under the leadership of Elaine White Gomez from Costa Rica. De Costa Rica, que es un país que decidió desde hace 70 años tener un enfoque distinto hacia la paz y la seguridad, aboliendo sus fuerzas armadas. Entonces, eso implica para un país como nosotros que nosotros tenemos pusimos toda nuestra confianza en un sistema internacional que a través de las reglas y de las instituciones podemos resolver los conflictos y eh, los problemas de la humanidad. In the course of the humanitarian initiative and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, again, women um, have been instrumental. We had uh, several women diplomats that were leaders for their countries. Um, we had some all-women delegations also participating in the negotiations. Um, we had women that were very active in the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Hay, digamos, dos enfoques cuando uno conversa sobre el tema de la participación de las mujeres. La primera de ellas, somos miembros de la humanidad, tenemos derecho de participar. También contribuimos desde la perspectiva de nuestra propia vivencia. Hay una contribución desde tener perspectiva una perspectiva distinta que refuerce eh, los procesos de negociación. I don't believe that women are more peaceful than men inherently, but I think that women play certain roles in society. If your main 
uh, perspective is, you know, feeding people, uh, providing health care to people, education to children. That's going to be your perspective on, on decision to go to war and use certain types of weapons. Furthermore, the voices of affected human beings were heard. Each person had a name. Each person was loved by someone. Let us ensure that their deaths were not in vain. Estamos hablando de seres humanos que en su experiencia humana, en esta vida, han conocido los horrores de lo que estamos tratando de solucionar. Eso le dio a la conferencia un espíritu de un sentido de, de ética y de justicia que no habría sido posible si ellos no estuvieran allí. Well, my job is to share my experience in Hiroshima and what it means to live in nuclear age, what horror that brings to humanity, and we should never ever let that happen again to another human being. That's my message, and I can't stop talking about it. I am going to keep talking. In July that year, 122 countries, about two-thirds of the total, voted in favor of the Ban Treaty. Now the treaty has to attract 50 ratifications for it to enter into force. The treaty uh, includes a broad range of prohibitions, uh, a prohibition, of course, on the use uh, of nuclear weapons, as well as the threatened use of nuclear weapons, uh, a prohibition on testing and production of nuclear weapons, uh, and indeed a prohibition on the possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, it also says that a country cannot assist another country to engage in any of these kinds of activities. But then it also demands that you help survivors uh, of nuclear detonations and help to clean up the environment after detonation. Um, and I think that that's really important language. It also has quite uh, progressive language on gender. Um, both encouraging uh, participation of women in all decision-making around nuclear weapons and also recognizes the gendered impact of nuclear weapons. I think we will move to a point where the taboo against nuclear weapons um, is as strong as the taboo against other weapons of mass destruction. If, if this treaty was insignificant, if it didn't mean anything, why were they fighting it? I also think it's really shown the power of civil society and governments working together um, we stood up to some of the most powerful, most heavily militarized countries on this planet and did something that they were forbidding us to do. The ability to kill massive amounts of people and uh, inflict suffering and pain on, on civilians is not a sign of power and prestige. It's what dictators do, it's what uh, human rights violators do, not respectable countries that want to have a good standing in the international community. And now it's their turn to be on the outside. They're going to have to justify why, why they want mass weapons of mass destruction, why they think threatening to mass murder civilians or end us all. Collective suicide is a reasonable security strategy. The Nobel Prize awarded to ICANN reinforced and publicized the campaign even more. And the headlines were um, Nobel Peace Prize comes to effect a little bit, which is exactly what it was. And it's such a great thing because we get to celebrate as a campaign of 500 organizations in 100 countries. And it's a huge validation for the work that those campaigners are doing in, in whatever context. And I think that's the most beautiful thing um, that I felt uh, immediately after. Just seeing our, our campaigners, these different all across the world, get on TV, you know, take ownership of the, this amazing moment that had happened and really be elevated and, and validated for their hard work over the years. In order for the treaty to be ratified in as many countries as possible, social pressure is paramount. The parliamentary pledge, the city's appeal, divestment campaigns, awareness raising, and mobilization are necessary for the prohibition to take shape. And then pressure must continue until the stigmatization of nuclear weapons ends in a real eradication. ICANN also has what's called the Parliamentary Pledge, uh, which is signed by over 800 uh, parliamentarians across the world. And it's a pledge to, um, to work to, to bring the treaty into force uh, in that country. Parliamentarians are the representatives of the people, and they have a huge 
role to play in shifting government position. Everyone can write to their senator or deputado, wherever they are, and get them to, to endorse the, the parliamentary pledge. Y disponemos de una red de parlamentarios tanto en el Congreso como en el Senado, eh, en apoyo de la campaña y de las posiciones del, de, del ICANN, ¿no? en pro del Tratado de Prohibición de Armas Nucleares, y en estos momentos están 92 eh, parlamentarios. So the, the uh, ICANN Cities Appeal is a commitment um, that cities can make um, to endorse the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and call on their governments uh, to join. Uh, nuclear weapons are designed to be city, city destroyers, uh, to have the maximum impact. Uh, to destroy as, you know, as many lives and, uh, and as much infrastructure as possible. Porque las bombas nucleares y los misiles están dirigidos a las ciudades, ¿no? Eh, es una amenaza a la gente que vive en cada ciudad. Luego es misión del ayuntamiento que esté preocupado por luchar contra la violencia, defender a sus ciudadanos eh, y a sus vecinos y vecinas frente a la amenaza nuclear. We went to our city council to divest. We spoke to the the finance chair of the council, and he said he would write a letter to the controller, who controls all the investments for the pensions of the city, which billions of dollars, you know, if we could get 10 members of the council to sign on with him. I mean, I called my councilman, and they told me he was on paternity leave. He had had his first child, so I wrote him a long letter saying, what a wonderful gift to your child to have a nuclear-free world if you would sign this letter and he signed. And it only takes a few people to organize with city council. It only takes a few people to organize an event at your local library or a church or a school um, to have a conversation and to make a difference to policy because all of this trickles up to policy making. Since 2012, the Don't Bank on the Bomb initiative has been working to make it harder to finance companies involved in the production of nuclear weapons. And what Don't Bank on the Bomb does is it gives everyone a pathway to resist nuclear weapons. People might not know this, but private companies make key components for nuclear weapons. And in order for them to be able to do that, they need financing from banks and pension funds. If you have a bank account, you can do something about nuclear weapons. You can talk to your bank and ask them, do they have a policy on investment? If you have a pension fund, is your pension fund profiting from the production of nuclear weapons? And if they are, why? You have a right as a consumer, you have power to do something, to change that. And people are. I also learned that the stigmatizing effect goes beyond law, but it also can have economic impacts, which are extremely powerful when we're dealing with um, the production and sale of weapon systems. Estados Unidos cerró su última fábrica de municiones en racimo sin haberse, sin haber nunca firmado la convención en contra de las municiones en racimo. You know, the U.S. never signed the landmines treaty, but we don't make them anymore and we don't use them. The decision to ban nuclear weapons will be a courageous one. It will change the world. There are billions of reasons why we need to ban nuclear weapons now. Each and every one of them has a name, a story, and a dream. El tratado es una herramienta bastante potente, pero el desarme nuclear no va a llegar con la firma del tratado. Necesitamos de un movimiento global. Necesitamos que sea que, que la gente entienda. De, de, de generar conciencia a nivel de todo el mundo. El primer punto de la primera marcha mundial fue tratar de luchar para conseguir que se erradicaran las armas nucleares. Lo mismo que están erradicadas las químicas y las bacteriológicas. Objetivo, volver a poner en la agenda la cuestión de la no violencia y la cuestión de acabar con las armas nucleares. La marcha lo que va es a recorrer durante varios meses eh, un montón de países, dar la vuelta al mundo. The nuclear weapon ban is a clamor that is uniting people of the world to defend themselves from the military powers. Beyond borders, a universal human nation is starting to take shape. A world without wars, without violence, human beings in harmony with the environment, 
and with rights while building a fair economic system. It will be a world that combines the diversity of ethnicities, languages and cultures together in a beautiful mosaic. In the story of human, we are in permanent evolution. Eh, y los cambios importantes no se dan de la noche a la mañana. Si las personas que estaban luchando por el fin de la esclavitud hubieran pensado que aprobando una ley o un tratado en un, eh, en un lugar muy específico no se iba a lograr, no tendríamos hoy lo que tenemos. Estamos en un proceso de transición y de cambio estructural. La comunidad internacional ya ha atravesado por esas etapas antes. Si nos vamos a la norma contra el colonialismo, se dio en momentos en que el colonialismo estaba en su máxima expresión. We've seen throughout history that making change has been the result of people coming together collectively, um, whether that's been the civil rights movement or women's rights, right to vote, um, or uh, ending slavery or ending apartheid. It's all been collective people's action that has changed the world. Uh, I mean, just imagine how quickly the world has changed its mind on other things. Things like gay marriage, that was very controversial and unacceptable to many, and then very quickly it just changed. And I think it can be the same thing with nuclear weapons. Uh, that it's just like, oh my God, remember when we did that? Remember when we had these like, crazy suicide bombs and like, we just thought that it was normal? One day, the nuclear age will be consigned to our memory like a bad dream that arose in a moment of fear and destruction. Once again, we are finding our way back to our historical path and it is precisely in our setbacks and moments of confusion when an evolutionary direction appears which has been guiding us since the dawn of time. We recognize that every person's life is sacred and we utterly reject nuclear weapons because they produce unspeakable harm and suffering in human beings. But, um you know, politics changes constantly. We're in a political climate right now that would have been totally unthinkable um, many years ago. And that doesn't only have to be negative. It can also be positive changes. It can also be quick changes in issues that we thought were in, intransigent uh, for a long time. And nuclear weapons is, is part of that. Working on nuclear disarmament is definitely uh, a passion for me. Um, it is my heart and soul, I think. Um, well, the whole project of of abolishing war, of challenging violence. Um, and it really comes from a place of believing that it is possible to change the world that we're living in. For me, what me motivates is the hope. The hope that it can be made the change and the conviction that we have to do it, that we have to do things, that this is not good. I'm really and constantly inspired by the people I get to work with. Because people who choose to spend their energy on nuclear weapons are not seeking fame and fortune. <laughs> uh, they're seeking to make the world better for themselves and for coming generations. To have the opportunity to work with such talented and passionate people, uh, to uh, be part of a historic process that will have uh, implications for the security and welfare of future generations um, is a great privilege and honour and I couldn't think of anything else that I would prefer to be doing. These weapons are not, uh, they're not a force of, of nature, they're not an act of God. We have built these weapons, we know how to take them apart. And, and I think it's important for us all to understand, no one of us is going to do this by ourselves. But if each one of us does that part of the job which is ours to do, we can be successful again as we were in the 80s and we can save the world again and we can look ourselves in the mirror and say hey okay i did what i was supposed to do we hibachi had been waiting for the ban for 72 years let this be the beginning of the end of nuclear weapons <laughs> <laughs>